Last night we had a most enjoyable time listening to some uh, wonderful experiences, powerful experiences that Mr. Kerber delivered to us, and uh, it was really a real treat for us. Now we are in for another treat, and he, Mr. Kerber is going to speak on a Bible subject, What is Your Future in the Space Age? And uh, during this uh, course of the time, he will answer whether the scientific achievements can guarantee a uh, secure future and also uh, whether a paradise earth is possible. Now we will listen to Mr. Kerber as he delivers this uh, to us. Most all people in all walks of life like to plan something for the future. But the world turmoil and the threatened destruction of the nations of our time has caused millions of persons to give up any hope for any kind of a future on the earth. In the meanwhile, the world powers try to turn the minds of the people to fantastic ideals, such as conquering outer space, and inhabiting other planets. So today a race is on between the East and West powers as to who will reach these heavenly bodies first and become inhabitants of another world. There they hope to find a future by science and discovery. The unusual scientific discoveries have been basis for these ambitions, but it is a very known fact that all these scientific achievements have first been developed in weapons for destroying humankind. For example, the first atomic energy was used at Hiroshima and exterminated 60,000 humans at one time. Since then, other nations have found the key that unlocks the mystery of the atomic energy. So the day the future security of any nation is in question, and many persons are heard to ask this question, what is this world coming to? The Bible answer is very simple. The Bible answer is that this world is coming to a consummated end. And if anyone has a future, it will have to be in a new world under the kingdom of God. Now we recognize that it's true that many people have prayed for God's kingdom to come will to be done on the earth and they pray with all sincerity these people realize that they're really praying for the end of this world every time they utter their prayer and this really means the end of their own lives because all their hopes all their ambitions all their desires for the future are wrapped up in this old world and this old world is doomed for destruction by the almighty God at Armageddon. So the fact remains that no one can have a future in this present wicked world. In proof of this, we find that every scheme, every work in the world always ends in sorrow, in disappointment, and in death. Just look about you. See the headlines in all the newspapers and all the nations. The pestilence the plagues, the earthquakes, the floods, the disasters. And as if, this is, as if this is not enough by the elements, men in power add political intrigue, commit crime, show hatred, and promote wars, killing men and women and children that only the Almighty God can give life to. Really then, can anyone find a security and a future in this world? The answer is emphatically no. So this could never represent God's way of life on the earth. It must therefore come to an end called the end of the world or the end of this system of things. But the question arises, why do we have such a terrible condition on the earth? We read in James 1.17 that Jehovah is the giver of every good and every perfect gift so that all of us are sustained by God and we all move and breathe and have our very existence in the Almighty One. As I read in Psalm 145, 16, God opens his hands 
and he satisfied the desires of every living thing. And by the way, I suggest that you take a pencil and take some of these scriptures down, because they'll quote quite a few, and then look them up when you get home. Don't try to look them up now as you go along, because I'll lose you. And then you'll miss a great deal of the scriptures. But if you look them up when you get home, you'll get a great deal more out of it. Now the point is, surely then the one who provides all the good things in life is not the same one who takes it away from us and makes us tough for us to stay alive on the earth. No. Jehovah is the God of the living, and God is love. Then who is responsible for this terrible condition? The answer is found in the Bible as 2 Corinthians, the 4th chapter and the 4th verse, namely, that Satan the devil is the ruler or the god of this wicked world system of things. And his scheme for power has brought suffering and death to the ends of the earth. As the Revelator clearly states in Revelations 12, 9, Satan has been misleading the whole inhabited earth. And then it adds in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. So mankind's only hope for any kind of a future is that God will change these conditions and then that he will establish a righteous system of things that will enable man to live in security of the divine will on the earth. This God promises to do. And this is why Jesus taught us to pray at Matthew the 6th chapter, the 9th, 11th verse, to pray, Our Father in the heavens, Sanctified be your name, let your kingdom come, let your will come to pass, as in the earth, or rather as in the heavens, so upon the earth. So it is God's will to have men and women live in this wonderful earth with a happy minds, a healthy bodies, enjoying everlasting life in peace, just like God established in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. This then was the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ all during his ministry. So the questions that was asked by his disciples was this, namely at Matthew 24, chapter the third verse, When? When shall these things be? And what will be the sign of your presence and the end of the world? They put those two things together. Jesus then enumerated a number of things, beginning with the World War that began in 1914, followed by famines, earthquakes, plagues, distress of nations, one nation against another, rumors of wars constantly. He gave this as the great sign that the world is ending, that the time has come for Satan's power to be taken away and for God to give Jesus all power in heaven and earth to establish a new world of righteousness, which will be ruled by the sovereign ruler of the universe, Jehovah God. Since 1914, then, this generation has witnessed these very things. This means, then, that God's prophecy for the end of the world and the time for a new world under Christ Jesus is now, in our time, in process of fulfillment. So Christ Jesus now comes with full authority to establish and secure a wonderful future to all those who really love their great creator, Jehovah God. But the world powers have not received Christ Jesus as earth's rightful ruler. Instead, they have projected their own plans for security in the United Nations and other bodies so that we read in Isaiah, the 8th chapter, the 12th verse, that Jehovah says to us, his people, say not a confederacy to all who say a confederacy, and neither fear you their fear, but sanctify Jehovah of armies, and let him be your sacred place, let him be your security, in other words. It is a significant fact, then, at the very time when Jehovah's witnesses all over the earth are pointing to the peace of Christ Jesus under God's kingdom as man's only hope. At this very time, the world powers in recent years have sent their ambassadors all over the world in peace forums 
but they have not found peace. Now there must be a reason for this. The reason is cited in the scriptures. Isaiah 57, 21. There is no peace for the wicked, my God has said. And then I quote again Isaiah 59, the 7th and the 8th verses. The way of peace they have ignored. Now none of them shall truly know peace. These are definite emphatic statements by the great creator himself through his prophets. In 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, the 3rd verse, Paul says, When they, the world, shall say peace, peace, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This means then that the fact that these things are taking place in our time, that we are very close to Armageddon. But how can the world have peace when they will not receive the kingdom message of peace and reconciliation to God through Christ Jesus? Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Surely we should all know that Jesus did not put it into the hearts of men to invent ballistic missiles that can be hurled across the ocean to destroy a whole nation of people in a few hours. It is Satan, the devil, who has moved men to devise the means of the atomic and hydrogen bomb to blind and shrivel the flesh of humankind in agony and a terrible death, and not God. All this is a diabolical scheme of the devil to defy the power of God's kingdom and to mock the Prince of Peace now that his time has come. No wonder Jesus said to his followers, My peace I leave with you, not like the world gives, but my peace I give to you. And then he taught them how to have that peace. He taught his disciples to trust in the given word of Almighty God. But the world powers have taught men to trust in the ingenuity of the nations to make superior weapons of war for their future and for their security. So today, Satan has two principal world powers with modern weapons, a war that could, if God would let them, destroy the whole earth. They are called the East and the West Block. In Daniel the 11th chapter, they are called the King of the North and the King of the South. They are primarily communism and so-called Christendom. Both of these classes or groups claim that they have salvation for the people, that they're going to set the people free from the present woes. They are therefore, both of them, false messiahs. Communism means to have all things in common union. But this union is not with God, it is not with Christ Jesus, nor with his brothers. It is against the Lord Jesus Christ as king and against all his brothers. The very fact that they have arrested and imprisoned Christ's followers in all communist lands and even told me in person at the embassy in Washington that they did not believe in Almighty God and they laughed at the name of Jehovah the Almighty God who made these creatures. Laughed at the scorn to think that anybody was so silly as to believe in a great creator. This shows conclusively that this is the work of the devil. And the peculiar fact is the very nation that defies God is the one that's so advanced in scientific discoveries and especially in destructive discoveries. This shows then that it is Satan's last stand. Now the word Christendom means Christ's kingdom. And so the so-called Christian churches have applied that to themselves and their mode of living has been adopted as Christendom. But they do not represent the, the salvation of Jehovah God, nor do they have the salvation or rather the fellowship with the brothers of Jesus, and neither do they join in publishing Jehovah's great name and his salvation to the people. In fact, the majority of the people who claim to call themselves Christians and go to so-called Christendom's church, when they pray, Our Father, the heavens, hallowed be your name, they don't even know what name they are hallowing. They certainly are not hallowing Jehovah's name because they don't use it. They don't set it aside. In fact, they are the main backers of the United Nations who have conspired against Jehovah 
and against his anointed by rejecting the good news of the kingdom while all the time they claim to be in covenant relationship with God and to be the actual political expression of God's kingdom upon the earth. So it too is a false Christ, a false Messiah, with a form of godliness, but denying the power of Jehovah by resisting the spirit of his kingdom message. So Jehovah says to them, as expressed in Psalm 50, beginning with the 16th verse, What right do you have to take my regulations and bear my covenant in your mouth? While you keep throwing my words behind you, you have joined the thief, that Satan who stole the allegiance that belongs to God. You speak against your own mother's son, and these things you did and I kept silent, so you thought I was positively like you are. But understand this, you forgetters of Jehovah God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. That the one who glorifies me and keep set in this way, he is the one I will cause to see the salvation of God. And that's what God is doing. While Christendom today is falling apart all over the earth, Jehovah is establishing a new nation, a new nation of people that bears his name all over the earth in over 185 lands today. This should awaken, this should awaken all people to the fact that something big is going on at the hands of the Almighty God. Another thing, let no man ever forget that all this earth belongs to Jehovah God and every person's life in it is from Him. It belongs to Him. He is our security. He is our future. God did not make man on the earth to live like beasts so that one group would kill one another because they happened to live by the, or born beyond their own borders. Jehovah created man and placed him on the earth for his great pleasure so mankind could walk and talk with God and he could enjoy a wonderful fellowship with man as the sons of God in peace and life everlasting. Then every part of the earth could truly say this is God's country. Today there's no political nation all the earth can make that statement truthfully. There's a constant turmoil of trouble and proposed remedies so mixed up that the average man is entirely in the dark of what's going on or what to expect next. He knows there's something wrong. He can see that there's a hand running on the wall, but he don't know what the reason is or what he can do about it. Now God gives the reason and tells him what to do. In Isaiah, the 24th chapter, the 5th verse, I quote, The nations have bypassed the laws of God. They have changed his regulations. They have broken the everlasting covenant. This is why the inhabitants are held guilty, and there will be very few men who will remain over, meaning through Armageddon. That's Isaiah 20, 24, the fifth verse. What is this everlasting covenant? In Genesis, the ninth chapter, the first 11 verse, it refers to the sanctity of life and the shedding of blood. And it shows there that no one has the right to take the life of another creature, of another person, except the one who gives life, Almighty God. Yet, we find that every government of the earth has broken that covenant by wars and persecution of God's people down through the ages. And the peculiar fact is that many, many clergy have condoned and blessed these world powers in their very acts so that in the last two world wars you saw Catholics in this country killing Catholics in Italy, Protestants in Germany killing Protestants here, and clergy on both sides praying for victory. How could there be Christians? How could they do this? So it reads that the blood of the innocent cry out to God against them. And unless God would do something, they'd have no redress. Therefore, Jehovah God says he will smite the earth and devour all the inhabitants, except a few men to be left to go through Armageddon, Isaiah 24, 6. This is what Jesus referred to in Matthew, the 26th chapter, 
and the uh, 52nd verse. He said, he who takes the sword will perish by the sword. All the world powers have taken up the sword. And surely they will perish by the sword of Jehovah God at Armageddon. As he promised in Jeremiah 25, the 33rd verse. Then those slain by Jehovah in that day will be at one end of the earth to the other end. They shall not be bewailed nor buried, but they shall be as manure on the ground. And then Peter states in 2 Peter, the third chapter, the 10th to 12 verses, Peter said, This evil world will perish in a great tumult and the destruction of ungodly men. But we look for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Look for a great new invisible power to rule over this earth in the place of Satan. And that's Christ Jesus as the king. And a new society on this earth, which is called a new earth. And that's now referred to as a new world society. Jehovah God is then therefore establishing these things right here on the earth as a new world society. So when he does destroy this wicked world in Armageddon, he leaves a body of people that represents his way of life on the earth and is also in a position to receive the risen dead and help them to live a righteous life and become all a part of the wonderful new world under the kingdom of God. Now the question is, who will establish that new world? Will it be some man's organization? Some church organization, the United Nations? No. In Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the 68th verse, it tells us that God himself, Jehovah himself, shall order it and he shall establish it. Well, who will survive this great arrangement of things? Who will survive Armageddon and live in this wonderful new world? The answer is in Psalm 37, 10, 11, and the 29th verses. There it says, it's just a little while and the wicked will be gone. He says, while you look for his place that he had, it won't be there anymore. You won't be able to find him. He'd be gone. He'd be dead. Non-existent. But the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in the abundance of peace. And then the 29th verse of the 37th Psalm, same Psalm, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. So if anyone ever says, where does it say that anyone's going to live on this earth forever? There's one of the scriptures. There's many others. In Psalm 37, 29. So today the world rulers, world leaders, prod the people to join their program. And in substance they say to them, each country says almost the same thing. Take a chance with us. Cast your lot with our destiny. This country can go wrong, and you can't sell this country short, so cast your lot with us. Cut out all this idea about, uh, about what God's going to do and the Bible's going to do. Why well, this thing's been going on for centuries, nothing's ever happened. Just throw in your lot with us, you'll come out all right. But when these speak like that, they're not speaking the words of God, they're speaking the words of the devil. Because in Isaiah 65 and the 11th verse it says this. Those who sit at the table of the God of good luck and cast their life in destiny, I will destine them to destruction, saith Jehovah, with the sword, meaning an Armageddon. So whenever anybody says, oh, when your number's up, your number's up, that's it, you're going to die, they're not talking God's language. You never heard Jesus say that, did you? Jesus always said, it is written. My father said so and so. And that's the way we as God's people want to do. And not trust in the God of good luck. Because the God of good luck is the devil. that tells you that right there. So that Jesus always tr told us to trust in the given word of God. And in Isaiah the second chapter, it stated, In the latter days, that's now, the latter days of the old world, that people from many nations would go up to God's house and there they would learn about their great creator Jehovah God he would teach them of his ways and they would walk in his paths 
And then it tells them another group in the same chapter, second chapter of, Ac of, of Isaiah, and beginning with the seventh verse now, that those who do not go up to God's house, but it says they take the, the counsel of the Philistines, who were always the enemy of God's people. They take the counsel of the world. And so they put their trust in gold and silver, which is no end, and in horses and chariot, which is no end. That means in war equipment and in great and in great the bundles of money that's put out for these various world programs. Just like in this country, there's 149 billion, not million, billions of dollars that's supposed to be a piece that's put out in the war program alone in the, a year in this country. They're trusting in gold and silver with no end. They're trusting in their missiles and their war equipment with no end. But what happens to them? In the 17th and 19th verses of the second chapter of Isaiah, it tells you, they shall hide in the caves of the rocks when God rises to shake terribly the earth, and they will throw their gold and silver to the moles and to the bats. Do you know they're preparing for that right here in this country as well as other countries? Up in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, not too far from here, I've been up there, there's a pentagon in the mountain, seven miles deep, mind you, seven miles deep. There's living quarters, offices, centrifugal fans to keep proper ventilation, everything you can think about, food, so that all these high officials of Washington can run up there to the Shangri-La in case they drop a bomb over in this country. What will happen to the other people, don't say. But they can hide in the holes of the rocks and carry all the gold up there. And they have the same thing in Tennessee and out in the Rockies and up in Canada. They're boring the holes in the rocks preparing for the fulfillment of that scripture. But that won't save them. As the Lord says, they'll simply throw their gold and silver to the moles and to the bats. It won't be good for anything else. But what about the future of those who listen to God now? Well, in Zephaniah, the second chapter, the second, third verse, he tells you, Seek meekness seek righteousness and it may be that you shall be hid in the day of God's anger and then in Isaiah 26 chapter the 20th verse and the 21st verse he tells where they'll be hid they'll be hid in their house in God's house where the blood's over the doorpost when the denunciation passes over and he destroys all the wicked, he, prefer, he, he preserves all who are within his house. And the house means the household. All within his household or congregation. Now who's telling the people about this? Today is Sunday, and I'm sure that there's big bundles of newspapers from every big city. And there you'll read all the dramatic events that are taking place on the earth. And they say, this man's going to do so-and-so. And that nation's going to do so-and-so. They never say what God's going to do. As if he's got nothing to do with it. Now isn't it reasonable if we've come to the world's end? If we've come to the time when God's going to change this whole scene? That he'd have somebody tell what he's doing? And what he's going to do? He certainly does. And I say the 52nd chapter... The sixth verse he tells us. He says, My people know my name. There's something to think about. God has a name. And his people magnify and honor that name. His name is Jehovah. If you think that the name of Jesus is important, how much more important is the one who made Jesus? My people know my name. And they know in that day that I'm the one that's speaking. Look at his eye. And how comely upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring the good tidings. Do you know this is the only good tidings in all the earth? Look at the papers. Look at the television or radio. Is there any other good tidings to compare with it? Who bring good tidings of good. Who publish salvation. Who bring tidings of something better. And who say unto Zion, Your God is now the king. The time has come for the kingdom. Yes, and he says, and they shall see face to face that Jehovah God now does reign. And that's why they go to the homes of the people. So they can speak face to face, just like Jesus was made flesh and blood to speak face to face with these people about the great creator, about his kingdom, and what he would do with this wonderful earth. 
And so God now has his people speaking face to face from house to house, city to city, village to village, giving the good news that something better, that God's kingdom is here and a new way of life is open now to the people. Well, have any responded? Yes, in Revelation 7 chapter, the 9th and 11 verses, it says the response is wonderful from every nation, kindred, and tribe, and tongue. Now people come out of the world's troubles, the world's affairs, and say here, this is the truth. We have found the living God. And so they cry out and say, our salvation belongs to Jehovah God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, meaning Christ Jesus. And just like saying, we tried out all these other governments. We tried out all these other schemes. They couldn't give us life. They couldn't even give us peace on the earth. We've learned that the great creator is the one who made us. He's the one who makes these promises. We're going to put our trust in him. And he can save us. He can give us life. And we believe in him. And so they respond and they cry out and they join in praising God. From every nation, kindred, and tribe, and tongue till today, there's over 185 lands with those people who are praising God. Now there's a reason why there's all over the earth these different lands. Because God will have all kinds of people be saved and become a part of his new world to go through Armageddon and there to live in the new world forever. Another thing is, when the people come back from the dead, they'll have the same mind, the same thoughts that they had when they went down, and they'll have to be some of their own people on the earth to receive them and to teach them and to help them in a normal way to find the way to life. So that when we read the scripture, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of Jehovah. It means just what it says. God made the earth for his purpose, for his praise, and that's the way it's going to be. So to these, God promised to send Jesus as the Prince of Peace at this time when he would cause peace to be, to be between their grand creator and all men of goodwill who turn to their creator. But the world rulers are living so far away from the word of God that they scoff when they're told that Satan has been ruling the world and now the time has come for a great change. For Jehovah says now in Psalm 125, the third verse, Iniquity shall have an end, and the rod of the wicked will not rest upon the lot of the righteous. That day is all over. That means then that God takes sides and he protects those who love him enough to listen to him, to live by his word as their law. So he says in Isaiah 51, 22, Thus saith Jehovah your God, who pleads the cause of his people, Look, I have taken the cup of trembling out of your hand, and I have put it into the hand of them who have afflicted you, who said to your soul, Bow down that we may go over, and laid your body in the dust and walked over you. Yes, they walked all over God's people in times past. But now that Christ Jesus is a wise and righteous judge in power is king over the earth, this new law of the kingdom goes into operation, the world powers are blocked from further carrying out this type of schemes and trampling God's people underfoot who are praising him. And therefore Jehovah says to them in substance, your lease has expired, you can go no further in your organized power over the earth. And this has left them in a state of confusion and perplexity. So that Jehovah says in Psalm 2 and the 6, 7 verses on, I put my son as king now upon my holy hill of Zion. Ask me, my son, I'll give you the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. It all belongs to him now. And be wise, you kings and you judges of the earth. Make up to the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is just kindled but a little. But the world powers have forgotten that Jehovah is God. They have no knowledge of his word. And so in the ninth psalm, the 17th verse, it says, They who forget you, Jehovah, they who forget Jehovah as the living God, they shall be brought down to Sheol, down to the grave. And then in three verses down, the 20th verse, it says, the last verse, it says, Let all the nations know they're but men. They're not God. And so we ought to obey God rather than man. 
So as these new laws go into operation, these world powers are blocked and confused. As Jesus says in Luke 24, 25, the rulers of this world have become faint out of fear and expectation of the things they see coming upon the whole inhabited earth. And so the world is in darkness and gross darkness of people. But what do they see that makes them so fearful? They have rejected God's word of promise for a new world. And now they're not ready for it. And the average one who's all involved in this world don't want to see God's new world come. They got too much at stake in the old world. So they have refused to, to listen to God's word of promise for a new world. Now they're not ready for its fulfillment. Nevertheless, Jehovah will surely tear down everything that Satan has ever built. And he will build a new world of righteous living as he promised in Revelation 21, saying in the fourth verse, Look, I make all things new. Therefore, Jehovah says to those people who want to live as God's people, but continue to stick to Christendom's churches, he says this to them, expressed in Isaiah 55, the second verse. Hey there, you thirsty ones. Why do you people keep paying out money for that which is not bread? And your toil results in no satisfaction. In other words, why do you get up 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning and get breakfast and rush out and make enough of money to come back to belong to a church and pay your dues as if I was going to get your passport to heaven and work your heart out for nothing? He says, come to me, all of you. Listen to me, he says in the third verse. And I will keep your soul alive. And he'll give you bread that doesn't cost any money. He'll give you the word of life. So Jehovah's Witnesses don't have any paid ministry. We think it's a high honor. We consider it a high honor to talk about our great creator. To give you a hope that we have. To know him. And to have this beautiful picture of the future that he has. The new world that he has. We wouldn't think of taking money for it. We figure that God has well repaid us by giving us knowledge of it and the privilege to tell it to you. And I'm sure that if you found the truth, you'd feel the same way. You'd want all your friends and relatives to know about it and to find the way to life. So that those who do listen, in Micah the fourth chapter, the second verse, it says they go up to the house of God and he teaches them of his ways. The house of God is the household of Jehovah. It's a congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. It always has been, not just in recent years. You read the 12th chapter of Hebrews and it'll show very clearly that all those men of old were called God's Witnesses. And they were counted as the house of God. So now you can study with Jehovah's Witnesses. You can come to the meetings. And as you learn and respond to Jehovah's loving kindness, and you dedicate your life to him, as David said in Psalm 31, 5. Jehovah, in your hands I entrust my life, my spirit. And there's no better place to put your life than in God's hands. So from then on, a whole new life opens to you as a Christian. You represent a new thing. You become a part of a new thing. That God makes new, all things new. Yes, a new way of life under the kingdom of Christ Jesus. You now begin to live by the word of God and not by bread alone. So a big thing is taking place all over the earth with all mankind of goodwill right today. God is making all things new and these people are becoming a part of the new thing, the new world. For example, we have, you well recall that when God unveiled this earth as man's home, in Job the 38th chapter it says that all these angels watching the scene they shouted and applauded. They applauded God and praised him for the works of his hands. Now Jehovah God is unveiling a wonderful new world which he provides to those who love him and he commands his host in the heavens and in the earth to witness this scene and to identify every one of those who are going to inherit life on this earth as the children of God. Saying in Deuteronomy the 30th chapter the 19th, 20th verses. I do take heaven and earth as a witness against you. That for today I have put life and death before you. And you must choose life for you and your offspring. By loving Jehovah your God. By listening to his voice. And by sticking to him. For Jehovah is your life. 
This means then that we are under a judgment period and all these angels of heaven are watching the scene. It's like a theatrical spectacle as Paul said in the 8th chapter of Romans. So that it means then that those who are living now and love Jehovah enough to, to listen to him, to live by his word, he says this in Deuteronomy 11, 18. You must apply these words of mine to your heart and to your soul in order for your days and the days of your sons that there may be as many on the soil as the days of heavens are over the earth. Why, it takes millions of late years for the focus of many of these satellites to reach the earth. And here he's describing that as a as illustration. If you listen to him now and write his law in your heart, let's take it to heart to do it, that your days on this earth will be just like those stars on the heaven. It'll be forever. Then you'll have a real future, won't you? Yes. So today Jehovah has a whole new world society of people who are living by the word of God all over the world. So God's will then has begun to come to pass on the earth as in the heavens in these people. Jehovah's witnesses live by the word of God and they reject the word of the world when it interferes with their integrity to the almighty God. And that means whether it's fighting in war, killing in war, blood transfusions, saluting the flag, worshiping idols, joining world politics, they keep faith with God. They are no part of this world as Jesus commanded his disciples not to be. In Job, the first chapter, the sixth verse, when God demanded that these various angels come before him to make a report, it says that Satan came also. And he said to Satan, What have you been doing? He said, I have been walking up and down in the earth. He's still walking up and down the earth and the whole world is walking up and down with him. Now the time has come when God will have a people not walk up and down in the earth with Satan the devil, but will walk with God. So in the midst of this wicked world, there's a minority group in every nation who have a different purpose in life than the world. It is to walk in the name of Jehovah their God as expressed in Micah the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. They look to God for their future. And he tells how they will build houses. They will turn their war equipment into plowshares. In other words, they will take their know-how and their talents and money and substance that they use down the old world and join the destructive forces of destroying the earth. And they will convert it all to building up this new world where Jesus Christ is the king over and they'll have a part in planting that seed of the kingdom and bring forth these new children of God and helping them to learn to how to live like they were taught. So they believe in God's given word, the Bible, and they're vitally interested in everything that God is doing and God's interest in them. They listen to God's word and they tell their neighbors about it. That's why they go to your houses. And God listens to them and he talks about them in the Bible saying in Malachi 3.16, Then they who loved God spake often one to another, and Jehovah listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before Jehovah of those who thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith Jehovah, in the day that I make up my own. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. And now God is making up his own people, into a wonderful worldwide society that bears his name, saying in Isaiah the 43rd chapter, the 6th and 9th verses, I will collect you together from the extremities of the earth, for everyone that's called by my name, I have created him, I have formed him, I have made him for my glory. You are my witnesses, and I am God. So when we read Psalm 37, rather 33 it shows us that God is watching the scene and in Psalm 37 10 to 11 he says it is only a little while and the wicked will be gone but the meek shall inherit the land and dwell in the abundance of peace and these Jehovah keeps alive, alive as the nucleus of a new world to inhabit the earth and to live according to his will to bring his will to pass in the earth 
So while Satan has turned the world's attention, yes, the whole world's attention, to Sputniks and Lunix and Atlas and the Bomar missile and all these various things and how they're going to reach the moon, something really big is taking place by God's hand. The old world is passing away right before your eyes. And Jehovah is preparing a new world society and people to inhabit this earth his way and to inhabit it forever. Don't forget this. In Psalm 115, the 16th verse, it plainly tells you that God made man for the earth. He didn't make him to live on the moon. And when Jesus died, he didn't die on the moon, he died on the earth. That man may come back to the earth. And this earth was cursed. And the curse has been lifted from this earth through the blood of Jesus Christ and the people who live according to God's will will live here on the earth as flesh and blood and not on any other planets if he wanted to put them on the other planets he would have made provisions for them so don't get wrapped up in what the world is doing because all these things are a diabolic scheme to detract the minds of the people away from the message of God's kingdom just like they did when Jesus was on the earth do you realize when Christ Jesus was on the earth, there was only a little handful of who were listening to him, following him? Such a small crowd, he says, Fear not, little flock, as your Father's good pleasure give you the kingdom. Don't worry because you're such a small crowd and the big, and the big crowd don't listen to me. All the attention was turned to Rome, what Caesar was doing. That was the big thing. And so it is today. They're all turned to the world powers, as if that's a big thing. So now the time has come when God's will would be accomplished on the earth. What does that mean? Well, it means that God's kingdom is here now. The time has come then for God's word to become the law of the land. And the commandment, therefore, is given to publish the word of God so everyone will know what God's commands are so that all who live by the word of God will find the way to life and will stay alive forever, just as sure as Adam if he had listened to God, he'd be living today. By, by his disobedience, he died. By the same token, to be obedient to God, they will live. All who rebel and refuse to listen will die. So we read in Acts, the third chapter, the 23rd verse, Any soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be completely destroyed from among the people. But the alternative is, described in Deuteronomy 30, 15 and 16. Now read it slow. I want you to get it. If you will listen to the commandments of Jehovah your God, I command you today, and that's now, so as to love Jehovah, then you will be bound to keep alive. And Jehovah will abundantly bless you. So Jehovah says to all of us now, in Isaiah 118, come here. Let us set matters straight between us. Let this, let's get this matter straight between God and man. So God is setting matters straight between himself and those who respond. And these are called the meek who listen to God and change their course of action. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, 5, the meek shall inherit the earth because they listen to God. These then have a future, a wonderful future in God's new world. So while this wicked world would be destroyed off the earth at Armageddon, at 2 Peter, the 5th chapter, 3rd verse, we read, we look for a new world, a new heavens, a new earth. That means a new life. A new life will be forever. Jehovah's people after Armageddon will not have to fight for the land as the world does. God will give it to them freely to all those who are goodwill who listen to him. Just like he did to Noah. When Noah came through the flood in the ark, he came out of the ark. He didn't have to say, well, I've got to go to farming, but I haven't got enough money to buy the land. It was all there, free. And God gave it to him. And he says he went to farming. And then he began to grow and raise his family and children, grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, and so forth. And so the earth multiplied with people. Now, after Armageddon, many of these people will be carried through who live, who love God. And just like he set that rainbow in the days of Noah, with all its beautiful colors, it was like an arch, and it represented a portal. And so God represented God's people going through into the new world, into the beautiful promises that are pictured in those colors of that rainbow, 
that God gives to those who love him and keep his commandments. And remember this. Satan will be bound. And if you want to know what that means, here in a few words it tells you in Isaiah 14, 7. It says, A great peace will settle down all over the earth. And the earth will be free of disturbance. And the people will become cheerful and joyful. Well, do you know what that means? When the people don't have to worry about fighting the wicked one and worry about death, the great peace that will come upon them, well, certainly they'll be cheerful. You won't see people walking around with a big, with having their mouth hanging down of all the troubles they've gotten. It's all is terrible. No, they'll be cheerful. They'll be happy. And a great cheerful sound will go up in all the earth that they found the salvation of God. And he's taking care of the matter. He's bound Satan. Yes, the wicked will be gone. Then it describes in Psalm 46, 9, no more wars. Just think, no more wars. Don't have to worry about picking up the paper and wonder whether your, your son that you've raised to love God is going to be drafted and kicked around and try to be forced into the war. Nothing like that. In Isaiah 33, 24, there be no more sickness in the earth. None of the inhabitants will say, I'm sick anymore. And God, for God will forgive them for their mistakes, for, their, for the mistakes that they made. They would make them sick now. God will forgive them for that. They won't be sick. Just think what that means. And then in Isaiah 25, 8, there be no more death. God will wipe out death entirely, he says. Well, you know what that means? If you have no more sickness, no more wars, no more death, you have no more graveyards. There's no happiness to God to have all these cities into a growing graveyard, getting bigger and bigger all the time. So he says in Hosea 13, 14, O oh, death, I'll be your plagues. O oh, grave, I'll be your destruction. God's going to destroy all the graves. And in place of those graves, there could be beautiful gardens. Yes, he says in Revelation 21, 1 to 4, I make all things new. So it would be a new world, a new way of life, with all men of goodwill as good neighbors, all living by the same word of God as the law of the land. But what would the people do? They will really learn the science of living. Now they only learn the science of some trade of existence. It's all temporary. And they know as soon as they get to be old enough out of high school or out of grammar school, it's only a matter of time before they're going to die. So all their ambitions and their hopes ends at the grave. But then they'll learn the science of staying alive, of living. God gave Adam back there the knowledge of how to garden the earth to live forever. If he'd been faithful, he'd be living right today. Not as an old, weasened, decrepit creature, but a beautiful, wise creature. And so he says in Isaiah 11, 9, the knowledge of Jehovah will cover the entire earth. Everybody in the earth will learn how to live. Then in Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, the 27th verse, all the earth will yield her increase and become like the Garden of Eden. Isaiah 35, the desert will blossom as a beautiful spring flower. Isaiah 65, 20, they'll build houses and live in them. Not, have, not build a house and have somebody take it away from them. They'll plant farms and vineyards and eat the fruit thereof and not plant another, take it away. And then in the 26th verse of Isaiah 65, nobody, nothing will hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. This is the way God wants it. This is the way he promised it. This is the way he's going to have it. Now today, God's kingdom has begun. God rules from the heavens. In Isaiah the ninth chapter, the 6th verse, he says he has put the government over this earth upon the shoulders of Christ Jesus. He has the responsibility to bring God's will to pass in all the earth. That means then one government, one ruler, one set of laws, one course of action for everyone. Only God can put these laws in operation to balance the lives of all nations, all people. But now through Christ's dominion, God's laws will be expressed. So God's will shall come to pass in all the earth for all people. God's express word is written law found in the Bible. So the Bible shall become the statute book as constitutional law for Jehovah's people throughout the whole earth. And it has already become the constitutional statute 
for God's people today known as Jehovah's Witnesses. This is foretold in Isaiah 26, 9. When your judgments are brought in the earth, then the, all the inhabitants will learn righteousness. This has begun now with the New World Society. So with God's laws become operative in the land, and the people living by the word of God, they'll come under the, the dominion of Christ's kingdom. And as they do the will of God, the blood of Jesus is applied to them. So we read in Job 33, 25, they shall say, I have found the ransom. And that's what it means. That means that they have found the way to life. And the blood of Jesus is applied to them. And it says the flesh shall become fresh in the days of the youth. And they shall return to youth for vigor. And they will see their face and shout out joyfully. They'll look in the mirror and say, come here, Mary. Come here, John. Look at my face. I have found the ransom and the blood of Jesus is being applied to me. I must have found the favor of God. And look, I'm getting these teeth back and hair back. And I feel stronger. I'm wiser. And I'm learning more about God. And so it says, This God will do to restore righteousness to mortal man. And the 30th verse he says, Then those who are in the pit shall come forth and be enlightened with those who are living. And that means there will be some people on the earth to receive them back from the dead and that was promised in Genesis the 8th chapter the 22nd verse when Noah came through the flood and gave this burnt offering to Jehovah and thanksgiving that he'd saved his life and it says Jehovah smelt it as a sweet savour and God said in his heart never again will I ever destroy all flesh off the earth as I've done before and therefore that ensures that when the resurrection comes there be some flesh here and when Armageddon comes, there'll be some flesh to go through Armageddon. We all know that the greatest sorrow of all is parting and death. All of us who have experienced the loss of our loved ones know this. But what a time of rejoicing will be to receive the memorial dead. And to know you'll never have to part again. Can you picture that? That great scene? Uh, people being in the field in their vineyards and suddenly their beloved son who loved God has come back and they run and tell all their neighbors and they have a feast to Jehovah it says in Isaiah 25 7 the fine wines on the leaves because it says God destroys death and they bring back the salvation of God well some people say well how are they coming back how am I going to know them now a lot of these people have been mutilated are they going to come back anything like they were before no, God will give it a reasonable body. And anything that's reasonable to him is very good. They'll have a good start. Well, then how will you know them if not, not the same? Here's how you know them. When the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, the first one to see him was Mary Magdalene. She knew him well. She went down to where his grave was, and she saw a man standing there, and she thought he was a gardener. And she said, what have you done with the body of my Lord? He turned and he says, Mary. The minute he says, Mary, not that he looked any different. He still didn't look like he had before. But he says the words, Mary, instantly she knew him. She's a Rabbana master. And she threw her arms around him and held on to him. He says, do not cling to me, Mary. I have not yet reported to my Father in heaven, but go tell my brothers I'm risen. And I go to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Didn't she have a wonderful message? And so it is. When the two other disciples on the way to Emmaus. And finally Jesus caught up with them. Asked them what they were talking about. And they said, oh, we're talking about one Jesus we thought was the king of the Jews and so forth. And he expounded the scriptures to them. Showing them how Jesus must die. And about that time the sun was going down. They says, come on, stay with us. The sun's going down. And he went in the house and they prepared something to eat and he said break bread in his old familiar way they said it's the Lord and that way he disappeared immediately disappeared and so it is they recognized his personality and everyone has a different personality just as sure as you have a different face how often have you talked to someone thousands of miles away I've talked to some people 3,000 miles away on the coast I've talked to a man over in London and I was trying to get him on the phone somebody else came on the phone 
They didn't tell me who it was. I knew it wasn't the man I was looking for. But the minute the man says tone, the minute I said price, he knew who I was, and I knew who he, who, I knew he, uh, who he was. Why? You have that old personality. And so it is. Your relatives can call you and they say, Mother's on the phone. How do you know it's Mother? You don't see her. Johnny's on the phone. How do you know it's Johnny? You don't see him. But you recognize that personality. And so they will be identified by all those who knew them. And they'll be introduced for those who knew them. So now, when Jehovah says in Isaiah 64, 2 and 3, if you're faithful to him, I had not seen, ear hath not heard, nor even mentioned to the heart of man, the things that God has a reservation to those who love and serve him. He means just what he says. So now let's get the picture. If you listen to your God, Jehovah, dedicate your life to do his will, and live as his new world society, right in the midst of this wicked world, you make his heart glad. You prove that God can put men and women on this earth who love him enough to do his will in spite of all that the devil tries to detract you to do. And then you go through Armageddon as Noah went through the flood, with God protecting you. And you emerge in the new world, and in an earth where it's all at peace. No more wars, no more sickness, no more death. A beautiful earth is a garden of Eden all before you with happy people in good health and all being right with God. Receiving their loved ones back from the memorial tombs. Learning the science of staying alive. Being among the many who will live forever as God promised in Isaiah 25, 8. Jehovah will actually swallow up death forever. He will wipe the tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of these people, he'll take off all the face of the earth. And they shall say, look, this is our God. This is what we waited for. Isn't this what we've all waited for? This is Jehovah. We will rejoice in his salvation. Yes, here is your future. Here is your real security. Not for a day, not for a few years, but forever and forever at the hands of the living God.